conditional information and historic information so you can have instant information at your fingertips. Wonderful. Okay, well, uh, then this concludes uh, this presentation. Um, we have uh, two more before the, the panel. Um, so again, um, thanks uh, Matthew and Quint and uh, Brad, uh, Bradford and Justin are, are next. So let me introduce them. Uh, and uh, the, the title of, of their presentation is uh, Covering More Ground Faster uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, th that is correct. Uh, covering more ground faster joint use poll audit data capture with Trimble mobile LIDAR. Um, and so uh, Bradford uh, Folta, um, he says that he likes technology and exploring better ways to make systems better and uh, that he was ruined in the best way possible, he says, by the IKEA workflow of efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, he is constantly exploring new methods and workflows that not only help his business, uh, but his customers' business uh, businesses as well. Um, and and uh, if I didn't mention it, he's with Honey Badger Analytics. Uh, and outside the office, uh, he's an avid cold water scuba diver, ice diver, hiker, and amateur photographer. Uh, he's constantly on the go, exploring new areas that others rarely get to see. And um, Justin uh, Brooks uh, with Trimble, um, uh, he describes himself as perpetually curious, uh, a mechanical engineer who is originally from Clearwater, Florida, and now living in Denver. Um, and he's a fitness and outdoor enthusiast who travels often and is always looking for new adventure or challenges. So, um, uh, Bradford and Justin. Thanks, Mateo. Appreciate that and the introduction there. And just to elaborate a little further, my name is Justin Brooks. I'm an applied geospatial expert here at Trimble. Um, I originally started my career at Regal USA, which is the manufacturer of some of the lasers that we use on the system that Bradford will be talking about here shortly. Uh, since then, I spent some time on the ground actually completing these production level projects for various applications. And now at Trimble, I actually help uh, increase the utilization of these systems across the board. And that led to our, uh, our work with Bradford here, which we'll explain in a moment, where I assisted in training him and supporting him through this massive project. Hi, everyone. My name is Bradford Volta. Um, you can see my screen, correct, Justin? Yep, looks good. Cool, fantastic. Uh, I'm the owner, CEO, uh, janitor, you name it, of Honey Badger Analytics. We're a small geospatial firm. Our focus is usually in the realm of um, Esri and helping customers um, get workflows set up and develop for their custom whatever they want to do in the Esri platform. Um, we also have the geomatic side. And so my customers typically consist of people that, well, rural uh, cities. So instead of having, as we like to say, in big cities, you know, 10 people doing the work of one, uh, in small cities, we have one person doing the work of 10. And so any way we can make it, you know, useful for them or beneficial for them to utilize current technologies to make their lives easier, we, we try to employ for them. And so, for instance, in the case of uh, covering 429 miles, which ended up turning into about 530 miles um, of ground in rural Vermont, we were able to employ the, the MX-9, Trimble's MX-9 system, and not only meet those miles, go over, or go over the 429 miles to 530 miles, uh, but also do so with amazing accuracy while listening to you know, Audible and Book on Tape all the way through it, uh, which is two crew members uh, consistently driving for about a week straight. So a little bit more about us. Um, we're an Esri partner, Esri Silver partner. We're release really ready. And for one of our water utility customers, we won the uh, SEG award back in 2020. We're also a member of the Digital Twin Consortium and we work closely with like uh, Justin at Trimble. Uh, I always, you know, badgering them with, well, could we do this or could we do that? Or where could we take this? Uh, and our friends over at TopoDot as well for the microstation um, side of, um, CAD services. So essentially when we get done with the MX-9 data, if we need to do any extra level of extraction or we need to do anything specific with machine learning, we take it into TopoDot and create workflows in there that help make it easier for us. So we make it easier for our customer uh, to get the data that they require. So a little bit about our project. Uh, 
we were assigned 429 miles or asked to do 429 miles of utility pole um, digitization and extraction, essentially figuring out where we could put in uh, new fiber lines that they're running out there for people living in the middle of nowhere, Vermont. And when I say middle of nowhere, uh, this isn't your small, medium-sized cities. These are cities that um, maybe have 2,500 people in them, surrounded by a rural area of, you know, probably about a thousand with, you know, 40 acre parcels and lots. And so we are in the bush as it were. What we did or what happened was uh, a friend of mine called me up. He's a pole surveyor out there with the GPS typically called me up and said, Hey, by the way, we got this large amount of land to cover. Um, you're the guy that knows, you know, GIS, GPS and all this stuff in and out. What do we do? And I said, well, you'll need something like a mobile mapping system or like a Trimble MX-9, uh, one unit I've always wanted to use in my career. And so we started exploring, you know, how would we go about it? What would we need to do? And what would that look like? And how would we get that data extracted from it? With that survey, though, we also realized that with the, like with the Trimble MX-9, you can see anything from where you stand on the road, except for the thing behind the other thing. So for instance, trees or, you know, a massive group of trees. And in Northern Vermont, there's a lot of trees and a lot of hills and a lot of, you know, valleys and this, that, and the other thing. Um, so we needed to be able to, or well, we offset it with boots on the ground and we needed to be able to see behind those trees because obviously you can't just run a, um, a fiber line, stop it, and then, you know, pick it up somewhere else where it comes back on the road or set new poles along that road. It might be a swamp that goes under the road. So we had it with the boots on the ground where the person would, well, my friend would go across those easement or those areas that were left the roadside um, and then meet up with the pole on the other side as we drove by and did our survey. So the typical traditional overview, like back in my days when I used to work at um, a fiber optic construction firm in New Hampshire is, you know, how many people is it going to take or could I get to do a traditional survey? So you figure if we have 429 miles, we have about two months to do it um, because winter's setting in and you don't want your people out in the the snow for very long. So we had, you know, November, December to get it done. Snow didn't come until like December 3rd. Um, How many will it take to get it? done. And so we were looking at 10 to 15 people, then outfitting them with GPS, outfitting them with uh, steady rods so they can measure everything, so on and so forth. How long will it take? Well, we looked at it and said, okay, if we got to train them from new, it's going to take a little bit longer than if we had seasoned guys. Seasoned guys cost more, however, along with the other cost of edit everything else. How many mistakes will potentially be made? If you're good at your job, and this is one statistic I absolutely love, especially from my days at Ikea. If you're good at your job, you will make two Uh, mistakes an hour. If I send you out to do a poll survey and you're making two mistakes an hour and you're doing a 10 hour day, you now have all these mistakes that in a data set that we won't see potentially for the next month or two, because you're going to be out in the bush doing your job. Uh, We're not going to babysit you. We're not going to micromanage. We want the data back as soon as possible, but we're also in an area that we realize is remote and we're dealing with areas that absolutely have no cell phone signal. Even when driving around in the MX-9, we sometimes, well, a lot of the times had no cell phone signal. So a lot of it was downloaded book on tape and you know, working with data sets that were downloaded to the MX-9 unit itself. Um, and then the, the other biggest question is how do you fix those mistakes? If you have a guy that's out in the field for three weeks and he makes 28 mistakes on all these polls, how do you get back out there to do another three weeks worth of work to fix those mistakes? And are there big mistakes? Or are there small mistakes? Is it as simple as he didn't identify transformers? Or is it something as, you know, complex as he wasn't using his GPS, he was just starting the GPS, not letting it figure out where it was, and then uh, running off and doing a survey. So everything was in air. How do you know, even at that point? The way we approach the problem with the MX-9, what can we see? And so when, when you're standing on the roadside, it is truly one of those, what can you see moments? If, if there's anything that you're looking around or under, well, obviously you're going to have an issue. Um, but if it's anything that's within, I would say probably about 900 feet of the road, you're going to see it pretty clearly as long as the, well, as long as there's nothing obstructing the lasers. Uh, the reason we didn't go with a drone side system was because drones have a limited life, essentially flying through the air. You have to do more setups. You have to worry about weather, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, versus with the MX-9, we're able to drive, uh, well, we drove eight hours a day for the entire week, um, but we have essentially four terabytes, which it will take to fill up. And you figure it's about 300, ter- or 300 miles per four terabytes with imagery and you know uh, 2 million points per second, essentially, uh, to fill that drive up. So we could easily do 600 miles if we actually had the people in the seat to do it for that long. Uh, we didn't have to worry about you know the sun setting or anything else and it getting dark. 
Um, our biggest, second biggest thing that we've focused on was what can't we see? Or those are areas where we're going to see poles leave the side of the road. Those are going to be areas where the pole numbers are obstructed by vines, or we have these different things that are happening. Um, and how can we better mitigate those? And in this approach, we realized that if we can collect, you know, 98% of the poll data and send somebody back for the two seconds, three seconds that it will take from the roadside to enter in all that information, it was much more efficient than sending a guy out there to do a poll every 15 to 20 minutes, 15, hopefully 20 minutes, most likely, um, and taking their time as they move down the road that way. Um, how many miles of road are there? It, at the beginning, this project started out at 500 or 429 miles that they, they asked us to do. We came in at 530 based off of, you know, polls that weren't even accounted for in the state's data as, as of yet. So it was one of those situations of like, oh, well, we got pole lines running alongside the road over here. We need to go back out and get. So let's get it done. What's the real world accuracy that they required, right? Um, for, for our customer, in this case, they wanted some meter accuracy, much like what you'd see with a typical poll survey. This allowed us to be and you know, to the surveyors out there, this is going to sound egregious, but um, a little bit more lax in our control. However, we were still within decimeter, I would argue on a lot of the poles because of the fact that um, we were only a few centimeters off what we use for control, which were road signs. Uh, the beauty of this is that it, it prevents us from having to set you know, spikes in the road and then have to go back and collect it over the 429 miles, but it also allows us the freedom to expand that range. And so, because we went hundred miles over, we were able to better expand our range because we we're uh, able to rapidly set control versus having to go out, set it in, you know, take a static point, figure out how to get, you know, VRS connection, so on and so forth. And what kind of software do we need? In this case, we jumped through three different platforms, essentially from the Trimble, uh, Trimble Business Center platform to the MicroStation platform to Esri platform. And typically these aren't you know, three that supposedly work well together, or you get one format that this, that, the other way. Um, in working with Justin and working with Mike Cook over at Topodot and my knowledge of Esri, we were able to make a very straightforward, uh, almost seamless uh, transition between all three. And so it really helped us out and helped us get a visualization to the customer ASAP as we were going through the poll extraction process. So again, yep, we did 530 miles in a week. That was a thousand plus utility poles within the first month. That includes processing. So you figure uh, the smallest town we processed uh, for registration was about 50 linear miles. The largest town was over 210 registered altogether, all road segments connecting together, um, making sure that everything was you know, accurate enough. You figure two to three weeks for all that in there. And then um, as we're also extracting poles, we're running some of the other larger ones behind the scenes. Um, we had no issue accessing property because we didn't need to. And so as you drive by people's houses and as you drive by, or as you drive around things, um, you're not actually hurting anyone's lawn or anything as long you well, if you do go across their lawn, as long as you take it slow and you're not, you know, doing donuts. Um, we, we were able to not only bring in all these things, but we were also able to see where poles disappeared into the woods and also able to capture a few poles on the other side of the trees that we didn't see there. So for instance, you would have, you know, one pole here, one pole here as the road bends this way, but there's a pole back here. Well, with the LIDAR unit, we were actually able to see it, maybe with the photogrammetry, not so much, but we were able to send the guy back in there and say, there is a pole back there. It, it doesn't just go, you know, like this, it goes up and over. Um, and with the combination of both boots on the ground and MLS or mobile land, mobile land scanning, uh, we were able to flip the usual paradigm where it's usually 20% of work in the beginning to get ready for the project. Then you go out and you do it in the traditional sense, 80% of it to get done at the end. This one, we had the 80% effort in the front and we were able to do the 20% at the end, which made it easier for us and the customer because we're always able to revisit things in cool, dry comfort of our homes versus you know having to go back out and stand in the field and find a pole or deal with you know snow, snow covered mountains and so on and so forth. Here is uh, just a view of what it was like. If, you, if we were to tape you to the top of the van and run you down the road with us, again, we don't work in big cities often, uh, mainly because we're, you know, we're all about helping out rural areas. Um, I laughed at Matt's uh, comment about it being a mid-sized city in Pittsburgh because he, you know, of the population that I was like, mid-sized city around here in Northern Minnesota is maybe 40, 
4,000, 5,000 people. Um, a bigger city would be like what I'm in now, 20 to 30,000 people. And then you get metropolitans like Duluth and uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, where Minneapolis, St. Paul is huge, but Duluth, Minnesota, 85,000 people at most. So with our approach and the way we did it, it was very easy to go from capture, as you see our van there driving down a uh, nice rural road, to extraction where you're looking at um, Topodont as we're starting to go in and start to pull up poll data as we're zooming in on it, um, all the way down to visualization in the bottom right where you see us in our pro presenting all the 3D polls. The customer only wanted poll data and they only wanted data specific to the attachment heights on those polls. They didn't, they weren't worried about the wire data like you saw on the, uh, in the previous slide. Um, but in doing so, you're able to see all those little yellow spots that show up all the way across are all the polls that we were able to see using our method with MLS. So our workflow, we started out, you know, planning, mobilization. Okay, GIS planning, that's what I do. I'm, I'm a GIS guy through and through. So we were able to map out all the areas that they wanted us to be, map out all the roads, use current data from the state, cities, anyone that actually had any data to help mitigate cost in this project, we were able to put it into a GIS map and plan that flow. Control setting, we, we set up with this idea that, okay, if we need to be submeter, we can get away with at least one control point every two miles or two control points every two miles, as long as they were something that we could see from the vehicle on the road. So street signs, post, poles, uh, guardrails, you name it. We used anything we had available to us that was existing to set our control in. And then coordination, working with the boots on the ground. As we were setting control, we were also uh, noting areas where we saw poles leave the side of the road, or if the pole line traveled behind a subdivision, we were able to say, hey, by the way, this goes behind the subdivision, so we're not gonna drive this, we're gonna have you walk this. Um, moving into capture, that's where we started to do the MLS and the boots on the ground capture. So essentially we'd wake up in the morning and we'd go our separate ways. Um, and everyone was doing their part. On the MLS side, Again, we were listening to a book on tape, just driving around, having a great time on the boots on the ground side. They were, you know, freezing to death, it seems, at points and complaining about the slippery rocks and everything else. Um, very envious of us and very much wanting uh, potentially the next project to get a UTV so they could drive an MLS system just across uh, the right of ways. Um, processing. This is where it is super intensive. You figure when we got all the data back, when I left Vermont, I had about 12 terabytes worth of data in my hand um, on one of my little external hard drives I have here on my desk. Um, when I got home and got it you know, processed and everything pulled out, not extracted, just pulled out and everything you know, visualized, you were looking at about 24 terabytes of data and then running that through registration and getting everything done correctly. Uh, to take it into extraction. That was probably the longest part of the whole process, only because um, with Trimble's like automated features in Trimble Business Center, it is pretty well automated. And so you don't have to do much. You just have to sit, it, sit there and let it do its thing. Um, computing power is another part of that, which is totally fun. I got to upgrade some of my computers, thank God. Um, and then finally, finalization, the review of the data. After extraction from Topo Dot right into Arc Pro, I was able then to look at everything, look at all the pictures associated with it and say, okay, what are we, what are we missing? What do we need to revisit? What do we need to do here, there, at the other place? In the same breath, I was able to push that up for the customer to be able to see things um, so they could be commenting on it as we go. So essentially they're seeing things in step with us as we're working on it, which can be both a curse and a godsend at times. Uh, visualization, making sure that everything popped up where it needed to be. We didn't have anything in the middle of Vermont or, you know, from Vermont off in the middle of New York, out in the middle of Lake Ontario, you name it. Everything was falling into place where it needed to be. And then we could also verify that with our boots on the ground folks that were finishing up their portions of it um, by going out and uh, having them stand next to the pole with their GPS. Are you within the submeter to verify that everything is going as well as it should be? And they often came back, yes. Uh, and then finally, handoff. A lot of the systems that we do and a lot of the, the data delivery that we do doesn't actually occur in a system that we own. We very much build our, our client systems and the, well, the systems that they utilize or work with the systems that they utilize to hand off the data in there. So they essentially own the data as soon as we're starting to generate it. Uh, this way they can start you know, building it into their processes and such. Plus it you know, gets rid of this whole idea of, I gotta send you a flash driver, or I gotta send you this, that, the other thing, or we have these you know, enormous accounts online that are taking up all this cloud space. So just a quick overview. 
this was our team. Uh, that's me, my partner, uh, just out there doing the stuff, me setting up the machine, my partner setting control. We use the Ford Fiesta for that in the upper right. And then us driving by as we do data collection all throughout those different roads. Um, if anyone wants, you know, an architectural rundown of what it's like for the different houses of Northern Vermont, let me know. We, we have plenty of different types from trailer houses all the way up to beautiful ones you see like that, the car just passing now. Results and final product. So it, we were able to get it located to decimeter in a number of cases. Some were a few, within a submeter because there was just no way we were going to win with the environment that was handed to us. Um, we got 8,800 polls by MLS, 400 polls captured uh, by boots on the ground. It, it very much lightened the load for the boots on the ground guys. So it was able to lighten the cost as it were overall and the time frame because we were able to do a lot of this very quickly um, by driving in a week versus the two, uh, two to three months that it took, you know, the boots on the ground folks. Total polls came to 9,200 polls. Uh, the, the biggest issue we have in this, these areas, especially using new technology like this, we can't guarantee you a number of polls if you can't tell us how many polls are there. So we had to price this by mile. And so what we did is we came up with a standardized price per mile. So it could either be in your favor or in our favor, but either way, we're still going through each of those miles and then, you know, trying to understand is this, you know, how many polls per mile do you got? Where's this all falling out? And, you know, where do we need to send in a guy versus, or for boots on the ground versus where, you know, we can pull all this information out with the MLS system. And again, the time was about two to three months in total. So you figure over the winter, we were able to turn around this project. So they were able to get going for permitting and such. Uh, coming up in that summer or the summer of 2021. Other applications that we, I, well, from my business perspective that I see this totally going and that I absolutely love because this is where everyone else is hitting as well. Whatever we can see, we can get. And so not to beat a dead horse on that, but it's, it's very much true. The, the issue we often run into is um, budgets. And so with small cities and governments, uh, if you have a guy that's worried about signs, he's only ever worried about signs. He doesn't think about his you know, other friend over in public works that's worried about you know, uh, sewer assets or what have you. Um, if they all were to pile together and they were all to share their budgets together in that realm where they wanted to offset money and cost, they could totally do it. And we could build a 3D model. We could go out and collect all this, build a 3D model form and actually have all these assets form. And we can extract this over time. And with something with the MX-9, not only are you, you know, getting 2 million points per second with a dual laser head, but you're also getting 360 degree camera with another two pan cams up the side. Plus you're also getting a pavement view. And with all those different shots and with all that different data coming in, we're able to extract more and figure out more. For instance, I can run an entire, you know, um, machine, uh, machine algorithm in topo dot that will actually pull out for rutting and everything on the surface of the road. And so not only, you know, will you know where your street signs are and uh, where your trees are and what type of trees they are, uh, but you also know exactly what the surface of the road is like, where your water assets are, where your sewer and stormwater assets are. So you can put all this together and then you can say, oh, we're ripping up Main Street, you know, um, like one of my customers in the middle of nowhere, Maine, we're ripping up Main Street. We might as well repair the pipes and everything as well down there, even though it's two different agencies, in this case, their water district and their town working together. Essentially, at the bottom there, if we can see it, we can map it. Um, and you can use the, utilize it for decision support tools, uh, making it easier for you and making it less work for you overall. Justin, would you like to jump in or are there any questions that we have? I think you did a great job uh, covering the project there. And Mateo, if there's any questions from the audience, then we'd be happy to field those. <laughs> oh, hey, you're, out, you're muted there. <laughs> Sorry about that. There you go. Hi, can you guys hear me now? Yep. We can hear you now. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> um, it had to happen sooner or later. Okay, um, so I was reading one of the questions. What are the benefits of this workflow versus other methodologies? I guess that's a pretty broad question, but and uh, you've already covered it somewhat, but uh, if you'd like to say anything about that. Uh, Justin, do you want that or you want me to jump on it really quick? Well, yeah, go ahead and take that one. Um, so the the benefit is, especially for customers like mine, that they're they're not looking for one of those standardized solutions that are out there because they don't have standardized problems. Um, they're looking to catch up utility systems from you know the 1830s. They're looking to figure out how to do something because they don't even have the infrastructure right now to support a system to store it in. Um, so this is where this is that you know that godsend that all in one capture. 
uh, system for them because we're able to go out and get a bunch of stuff. And so we can alleviate that problem or that, as I like to say, transitioning to the future, uh, we can alleviate the issue of getting them caught up to today. Um, often I, I tease them and I say, you know, it's actually a good thing you waited so long because you, you're, you don't have to play catch up and deal with all the problems that the other folks did. You can just jump right to the solution, much like you see India doing with like cell phones, you know, skipping over the whole telecom industry because it just went straight to cell phones versus having to build out this whole infrastructure. So. Yeah, and on that note too, I think another uh, some benefits there is really just the speed and safety aspect of it as well. Really bringing these surveys from a lot of the a majority of the work in the field to back in the office, and I think that is a you know a huge benefit, especially in these more dangerous areas. Mm -hmm. um, what other applications could this technology be used for? Oh, Brad, yeah, you kind of, you, uh, <laughs> you jumped into that one at the last slide there a little bit, but I know you've had some other uh, ideas that you've been playing with as well. Do you want to take that one too? Yeah, well, so <laughs> this is the fun part about the MX-9 system. Um, it, like when I go to get it insured, everyone's talking about, or well, my insurance companies are always just like, well, that's an expensive system to, you know, to run and to deal with, da, 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 da. What if you get in a car crash? And I was like, I think it would like it. Um, the, the, the applications are endless. Again, if you can see something or, you know, from the area you're standing, you can map it. Uh, and with the MX-9, you're going to see it, capture it and get a photo of it uh, in the full 360, you name it. And so I have, you know, prospecting clients right now that, you know, want me to mount it on a boat. They want me to take it across a mountaintop on a UTV. They want me to, you know, put it on the back of a golf cart and scan their golf course. It's one of those systems that can truly just be transferred around. Um, the only, the only part that I ever ran into a potential issue with is when Justin told me that uh, the IMU in it is a step down from what, what missile system is it? <laughs> so it's basically I, the highest grade commercial IMU you can get before yes. it would go into a missile system or something along this line. It, and that was for a customer that was looking at utilizing us in Canada to do like the, the shoreline of Toronto along with capturing downtown Toronto um, because of, I, well, and I, he said, you might just have an issue at the border. Justin said, you might just have an issue at the border. And I was like, I don't even know how to explain that to somebody. Um, <laughs> but no, there, it, it really is limitless. And if, you know, with the MX-9 system, the beauty of it is because you can capture all this area and you can see, um, you know, 900 to 1500 feet away, you can also tie in with an X7 and then go to the interior of buildings and you can start to add all this data together and register it all together to build out your full city and your full true digital twin. Mm -hmm. um, how long would it take to collect similar data with traditional methods? I don't know if you've done any exact compare, you know, close comparisons, but. It's it's so you could do you could do two to three months. And so the beauty of traditional method is you can do two to three months in the same time frame. The the difference is is it's not two guys and then one subcontractor that's out there doing boots on the ground. Instead, now it's like 10 to 15 guys. And they all each have their own GPS unit and they're all going through and you essentially have to manage a crew now versus you know two to three people. So it's yeah, yeah. Essentially, if you throw enough manpower at it, you can do anything in you know a small amount of time. The only downfall being, you know, how many errors are you going to get back and how inconsistent is it going to be versus we, as I joked with the, the Trimble MX-9, we've now taken it down to one point of failure. And if it fails, we know because we're in the van with it. Um, however, if it's everything's successful, we just continue to listen to our stuff, keep moving along. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. What do you use to drive plan? I assume uh, the person means to, to plan the route uh, or to, um, yeah. Yep, so me being an Esri shop, I use Esri software. Um, so essentially if you're the customer and you ask me, hey, by the way, I need to do this many roads or I need to go across this country, da, 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 da. Um, I essentially work with you to figure out, you know, the best routes possible based off of how we can route it with the routing software, well, with the routing algorithms built into Esri. Um, okay. Um, somebody else asked, uh, what was the problem statement for this project? Problem statement being, I guess, what was, what were the requirements? What was the, what was the, yeah. Oh, so they, they essentially, they needed, um, 429 miles of, uh, pole or pole utility survey, and they wanted 18 fields from those poles. So essentially pole numbers, you know, the attachment heights, um, blah, 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 blah. And essentially the, the, um, 
the distance between your secondary power and the top of your telco. So they could figure out if it was easy to put in a fiber line or if they needed to move attachments on the pole. Good. Um, recognizing the benefits of using LIDAR to do data capture, how many of these applications do you believe could be adequately addressed using only photogrammetry or cameras plus computer vision? That's a good question because I argue with this a lot in like the private times <laughs> on LinkedIn or talking to folks directly. Um, the, the, the issue I've seen with photogrammetry and people can disagree with me on this all they want is that they, the, it's a picture and you sometimes get a lot of bulbing or you get a lot of uh, different distortions in photogrammetry, right? Because the pixels can't always come through 100%. The beauty of running something with photogrammetry and LiDAR is I'm giving you the skeleton essentially to put that photogrammetry around. And it makes a much better resolution in your photogrammetry. Um, if you, well, case in point up here in Brainerd, Minnesota, where I'm at, where you have, um, you know, Google imagery, if you go down to Minneapolis, it's beautiful imagery and everything looks fantastic because they've overlaid it on LIDAR to, to what I suspect versus up here where your trees look very just bulbaceous. They just, you know, they don't look like real trees. They look like, <laughs> yeah, like spheres just hanging out. Um, and so it is one of those things it's, you know, it, Photogrammetry has its place and it is a wonderful system. The downfall being if, if it's at an oblique angle, if it's this, that, or the other thing, there's too many areas of error versus when you're looking from the ground up with LIDAR uh, and overlaying that photogrammetry, you reduce that amount of error because you're also giving it another surface or medium to attach to. Uh, you may have addressed this earlier, but uh, how long did it take you to capture all the data and, and remind us uh, of the, the basic figures about what you're, you were collecting? So we were, well, we were looking for essentially primary power, secondary power, pole height, radius, you name it. So anything that we, for the 18 attributes. Um, with that though, we did 530 miles in total um, based off of you know the data I have sitting on a hard drive right now, 530 miles in total um, in about a week. And so you figure we were doing upwards of hundred miles a day, anywhere between 30 to 65 miles an hour on the roads. Um, we don't break the speed limit, by the way, when we drive with the scanner, because you can't, because it's limited to 68 miles an hour. <laughs> so. um, yeah, well, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, any, um, again, lessons learned or, um, I, I was thinking uh, uh, it's a bit apples and oranges, but uh, your um, inventory of, of those poles versus, uh, <laughs> the inventory in, in Pittsburgh or the, the, the light poles, you know, uh, what are some of the, the differences between the, the, the different, uh, you know, environments and, and the, the differences in the challenge? Uh, so like where we were, um, the, the fun part is, is it's, it's a different type of canyon effect, right? Because we actually are in a valley or a canyon. And so we're, we're dealing with uh, geometries potentially being lost from satellites because of the fact that we got trees and, you know, just tall hills around us versus like what you get when you're in downtown Pittsburgh or New York City. Um, so it's, it's urban similar. Canyons. Yeah, yeah, urban, urban canyons. Um, but the, the, the fun side about it is if this would have been, you know, a multi-organizational like data capture, we could have easily added in the streetlight portion of it because we had plenty of poles with streetlights on them, uh, especially when you're driving through these, you know, small downtowns and even, you know, the occasional um, actual, uh, what is it, stoplights and such. Uh, but because it was so, so specific to the customer's needs, we just left all that data sitting out there, essentially. Um, Justin, any other, anything else you'd like to comment on from the Trimble side? Uh, well, I guess on that last note, um, you know, it's always good to keep in mind that this data could be pack repackaged and reused for multiple purposes as well. As, as you said, Brad, you kind of left a lot of data just sitting there because it wasn't in the, the project scope. But now you still have access to that data going forward if it was ever needed again. Um, so just keep in mind that when you're using these types of systems, you're capturing everything around you, as Brad said multiple times, everything you could see, essentially. Um, so kind of that opens the door for much more than often what the what the customers are asking for and allows us to kind of reuse this data going forward uh, for a variety of applications that we see here. That's, um, yeah, another, another small town, sorry to jump in, Justin, but another small okay. town I'm uh, talking with uh, doesn't like the idea of, you know, um, having or the privacy issues of having all this data, but they also see the the 
the use case of, oh, hey, by the way, I can go to you for this, that, and the other thing, and you essentially just store this for me. And it's like, yeah, if you need your street sign survey, as long as you don't get hit by a meteor or you don't have a bunch of drunk drivers, everything's fine, right? Like the street signs don't move very often. So we can easily go in and extract those out and bring it back and uh, have it for you the next year without having to do the full cost of going out and redriving it. Well, you, you, meant, you just mentioned uh, some privacy concerns. And earlier you were mentioning about the different uh, kinds of houses along the way. So I was thinking <laughs> yeah. to what extent uh, you were, you know, incidentally capturing some of the, you know, private property and, and homes and so forth and whether there's any, any concerns about that. And so like for, for this instance with this, with this client, uh, there was no concerns about it because we're just extracting pool data. Even though like I had a dog walker in one of the photos, I had another person thinking that they were on the Google camera. So they were like waving with all their friends. Um, so it, the, those are pictures that we get to see. And those are pictures that we can easily get rid of, or we can use, um, you know, algorithms to delete out faces or essentially just blur them. Um, from the housing side, you know, if the blinds are open, the lasers can see through. And that is a thing that we worry about because, well, in our case, what we usually end up doing is we end up cutting the roads in, right? So you only see the assets that are in the right of way of the road, not actually everything beyond it. Um, but I did tell many of Vermonters, I was like, if you are standing on the roadside, when I go by, I'll be able to tell how tall you are almost to the millimeter. <laughs> and they're just like, don't tell my wife. I told her I was 6'5". <laughs> <So. laughs> well, and on that note, Mateo too, there is some software solutions out there now, both with um, you know TMX, which is essentially Trimble rebranded Orbit GT or Topodot as we've discussed too. Uh, and now I, I think TBC will also have some capability to now blur and erase some of these things in photos as well. Um, kind of have an automated routine to run through and, and kind of remove some of these things that might be a concern to people. Um, so yeah, th there's multiple ways that we could approach such a problem. And there are software solutions, or as Brad said, we could also go through and kind of eliminate any of the photos that might be questionable. That's pretty easy. Uh, one more question that just came in. Uh, do you have any experience using this data to do a full poll loading model? Mm -hmm. I have no experience yet, but we have been asked, and it is an area that we we would easily work with an engineer on, uh, if anyone knew an engineer buddy out there <laughs> that wanted to do it. Um, as I always tell people, I am I am a GIS expert. I am not the expert in your field, and I never want to be, so I'll never replace your job. <laughs> and so if, if you want to bring your knowledge to the party and we can work together to build out something, then, you know, please, let's get on the phone together. Um, or if you, you know, if you're that customer and you know the two companies that you need to bring together, that, you know, introduce us. We'll I'll definitely talk to somebody and say how we can help them and help you get what you need. Yeah, we certainly have other customers out there, other uh, utilities and service providers that do such work as well. So yes, that's certainly possible with this type of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I really know little about this. I'm, I'm thinking about the sort of the, the sag in the line, you know, the catenary, mm -hmm. uh, and whether you can you can get that just by looking at the angle from each pole, or whether you have to, you know. Um, Look at the midpoint or something like that to to measure it, um, and you know to what extent um, that kind of information could be could be extracted from what you already collect. Well, and see, uh, jumping back to the drive through that we have, this is essentially doing just that pulling. Uh, this is line work that we pulled right out of the point cloud. Uh, the other the other reason the MX nine is like something that's in our wheelhouse or in our toolbox is because of the fact that um, unlike drones that we've seen out there. Uh, right behind the MX-9 on the surface of the road, we're getting about 5,000 some points per square meter. Um, whereas the line that, you know, in this case is what, 25 feet off the road, we're seeing it as if it's a solid line of just pure points. And so we're able to extrapolate that data um, and get that seg in there, calculate, you know, when it goes over the highway, what is the distance between that and the highway for safe passage for trucks, so on and so forth. Um, and the other, the other thing would be uh, vegetation encroachment. Yep. Um, that that could be extracted also from this, right? Correct. Vegetation encroachment um, down to you know whatever whatever unit you measure in for cubic footage or cubic meters or what have you, um, along with also uh, like a number of them we saw in Vermont. I'm trying to uh, find. Oh, I thought I jumped to the wrong one there. But where you're dealing with um, oh, what is it? Anchor points essentially for the the poles. Um, the the guide wires, as you see, uh, when we get closer to, I think one on the left here. Um, but yeah, essentially where those are slacked or not slacked properly. 
And so where you have issues with, you know, um, well, what most people don't know is there's a lot of weight up there on those power lines, right? And so if you have a pole that's not doing its part, it essentially causes issues for the poles down the line and can cause poles to fall over or tip. So where where we can tension those wires or where those tar- wires are tensioned, over tensioned and under tensioned, you can also start to pull from this data as well. Right. And um, I guess this is sort of the the final part of the distribution of the, ne- the network. So, you know, the, the, the high tension wires... Uh, you wouldn't get with this, but um, the oh, depends how close you could drive to them, I suppose. Yeah, and even using an off-road vehicle, you can get underneath. I mean, you you occasionally get vehicle. some, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we can we can see up to fifteen hundred feet away in almost any angle. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's what, what I noticed about this is we had what five thousand one hundred some points on the road behind the machine, right under the vehicle, and then we were running at about nine hundred feet, probably about two hundred points uh, per square meter. And so like you, you do lose density, but you still see a lot. Um, my favorite was there was the landscape went down like this, but the house, you know, at back of the garage came up like this. And I saw the back of the house garage, but I didn't see the rest of the land continuing underneath it. I was like, that's pretty cool. Cause it just pops out of nowhere. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Brad, uh, Bradford and, and, and Justin.